Jason Smith there speaking to John Duggan about his decision to retire at 35 years of age. Again, six Paralympic gold medals, eight World Championship gold medals, six European gold medals, and he retires as the world record holder in the 100 metres and 200 metres T13 category. Kleena Foley is with us on the line. Good evening. Hi, Joe. We won't see another Jason Smith. No, definitely not. Um, I think he was just uh, an extraordinary sprinter. That's what you need to say about him. The guy was just unbelievably good at what he did. Beautiful technician and very relaxed classic sprinter in that he, he he's totally laid back off the track. They make the best sprinters. You know, they just turn it on when they have to. Um, but it's an extraordinary career when you think uh, 18 years unbeaten. And while people might look at that and say, well, you know, how competitive are the Paralympics? How many people are in his field? The reality is that every single year, more and more people started turning up. In the beginning, he was really racing the clock. You know, he won a double in Beijing, a double in uh, London. Um, but his performance in Tokyo, where he won the 100 metres by one hundredth of a second um, against a guy who had, an Algerian who turned up really uh, out of nowhere that year. That was the performance and that's his that's his preferred performance as well because he said he had, he said today I had to dig to somewhere I'd never gone before. Um, and actually his time in Tokyo as well was faster. Um, he ran 10.53 to win it, won it on a, a photo finish, almost caught on the line. It was extraordinary. Um, and the year before he, I, or sorry, the previous Paralympics, he had won, I think it was uh, 10.59. So like, you know, he managed to hold his form and that was vital. But um, I mean, just still third, third all time on the Irish list. Only Israel Olatunde and Paul Hessian have run faster than him. Mm. So just a, an incredible 100 meter sprinter. And also incredibly, um, do you know, he? I think, like he won an Irish schools double, you know, when he was a kid, um, which is a massive thing in Irish athletics and then got involved in Paralympic sport, but then mixed both able bodied and uh, and went to was a semi finalist at European uh, championships and ran in the world championships in 2011 as well in able bodied. So but what he did, I think, was that he 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 decided that, you know, he was going to be the best he could be. He went to America. He trained in America uh, with a guy called uh, Lance Broman. And that was when he started, uh, like he hit 10.22 out there. And that's that time that's still third on the all time list in Ireland as well. So just a phenomenal, phenomenal um, technician, but also uh, totally laid back off it. And I, he was laughing today and he was saying he looks back at interviews now and looks and thinks I didn't sound very excited about that mm. when I when I should have. But that's just my personality. Yeah, that 2020 Tokyo win that you mentioned, and that he's very fond of, uh, not least because of the 10.53. But uh, that was a year where he'd been dogged by injury, as I understand it. There were question marks over his age. And what's more, the Algerian opponent who lined up beside him had been running faster than him across that year. So there was quite quite a lot not stacked up in his corner. And yet it does suggest uh, a temperament on his part, uh, allied to the brilliant speed and everything else. Yeah, they came out in the semi-finals and the Algerian ran 10.59 and Jason came out and ran 10.74 and he knew he was, he was, this was it. It was either make or break. And he had to start, he had to have a brilliant first 60 metres in that and that's exactly what he did. The Algerian was coming like a train over the last 40 metres and uh, and he just got it on the dip. And just to do that at 34 um, after, as you say, just a season that had been wrecked. And he ran 10.59 last year in, in Malta, I noticed. So like, it's not like he still couldn't produce those kind of times or certainly for, you know, still be up in a 10-5 uh, range. Mm. Um, and that's incredible, uh, you know, at this stage. Do you know what's forgotten as well, I think? Um, because his disability isn't very obvious, Joe, I think it's always underestimated how impaired he was in some aspects of his training. Like if you don't drive, an elite athlete who can't drive, who has to get to places, who has to get to training every day, you know, who arrives in an airport and can't read the boarding uh, boarding things above him, his head, all this stuff makes, you know, for apart for an impaired, visually impaired athlete, apart from what the training they do, it's just the daily grind of getting places, you know, and 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 the time that has to take up in family life as well. Um, and I know when he, he he's based in Belfast now, and I, I think he used to take a bus, and then 
from training, he would take the train up to, to over to the Sports Institute. And, you know, elite athletes, when you think about it, most of them, they just hop in their car and they go and they're always up against the clock no matter what they're doing. So, like, there's that element that is additional on him, you know, that is just, it makes it such a grind and so incredible that you would just have to be, as he said, he had to be ultra selfish. Yes. And has he ever spoken about how uh, the impairment, the visual impairment affects what he can see on the track? Uh, like, you know, you're moving at ferocious <laughs> speed and you've got to obviously stay in yeah. a very straight line. And these are all things that able-bodied athletes don't have to think twice about. Yeah, he used to, um, in 200s, affected him much more because he was running a bend. And he has very little centralized vision, so he would be he would be running a bend really with a kind of a with a fo- with a fuzzy outside line to him. He wouldn't quite know where he was. So two hundred meter was always harder for him to run, and then it was taken out of his T thirteen out of his um, category um, before Rio. Yeah. So hundred was hundred. He said hundred. No, just literally <laughs> head down, go straight. You know, I always laugh and says that's that was never a problem for him. You know, and as I said, he he always uh, even at Irish schools I remember when when the Dublin Irish schools um, just absolutely flying but the, the amazing thing about him was as I said he was you know he was running against the clock when he started out in 2008 in Beijing 20 year old he only had the clock to beat you know and that's what he had to beat really for three Paralympics but the time and, and injury and everything was catching up with him in Tokyo and that's why Tokyo was so incredible because he still managed to beat, beat them Okay so his category or, or the requirements for it didn't necessarily uh, shift and, and, and open it up to others. It was just a, a gradual that, increase in depth. Standard, the depth, Joe. The depth keeps coming all the time. And it's funny, I was talking to James Nolan today, who's head of uh, the uh, track and field side for Paralympics Ireland. And, you know, he's just saying, like, the standards have now gone so high that it's getting so difficult for Irish athletes to qualify at Paralympic level, you know. And we've lost a whole load of them now. Michael McKillop has retired, you know, a, a, a multi-medalist. Um, we, we've we lost over the last few years, we lost the three brilliant discus throwers from Cork, Neve McCarthy, Orla Barry and uh, Noel Lennon all retired. So there's going to be a gap here now. And that's one of the reasons why Paralympics Ireland want Jason to come on board. So he's going to work for them now. They haven't lost him. They've, they've offered him this job and he's going into work. He will work He will work from a high performance level. He'll also work, obviously, in marketing and commercial and all that side. But I think he feels that his experience and the experience he garnered, which really helped him to win that medal last year, he pulled it out when he need, or two years ago and he really needed to, that that will help the next crew to come on board. But you know, I think that at world level and European le- uh, world and Paralympics level for a while, it'll, it's going to take a while before they transition some junior athletes up to this level because he was an extraordinary talent. We may never, ever, ever have a talent like him again. As I said, the third fastest man in Irish history. And just I think as well, he was he was a he was a he was a racer. He loved to race. Yes. You know, he was, he was a guy who produced it on the big days. And that is part of his, that again is part of the personality. You know, sprinters are always, the top sprinters, Paul Hesham was exactly the same. Olatunde seems to be the same as well. They're totally laid back. And that is what allows them, I think, apart from the work ethic, but it allows them on those big days to stay relaxed and produce the big performances. He was yeah. very close at qualifying for the Olympics as well. And he was only one. He was only four hundred short of it for 2012, actually. And he was trying to do both. He was the first uh, Paralympian to compete in the European Athletics Championships. As I said, he made a semi-final, yeah. and he, he came that close. That 10:22 was just short. I think it was 10:18 for London was the 100 meter qualifying, the A standard, and he was just short of it. And in the end, he came out to national championships, and and Paul Hessian beat him in national championships and took the place. Mm. So he still got to London, and it was an incredible. And those were transformative games, if you remember. Yeah. I know he feels that as well. That Channel was, 4 took them and they were given yeah, prominence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he feels that that was a sort of a transformative time where people really started to respect what Paralympians did. But he still feels, and rightly so, I think that um, there's still a long way to go um, in terms of people understanding just how high performance they are. Yes, oh, I think so. I Like, there would be a very uncharitable view of uber-successful athletes uh, like Jason, uh, which would amount to, well, his category uh, parameters obviously, obviously suited him and fell into his lap. And therefore, he was just a beneficiary of that as opposed to the obvious talent, as you say, third fastest man in the history of the country. 
Yeah, and I think there's a good. There, I think as well, what happens is like you know, there's so many categories in in Paralympic sport that people see, you know, seven hundred meter finals, and they think, oh, he's won one. Um, uh, you know, so where does that? What does that mean? And they start to they start to get confused by that. Whereas in in you know, open athletics and able body athletics, we just see one hundred meter final and that's it. But you know, the reality is he was the fastest man always, um, and the fastest man in history. Uh, in that hundred meters for for that long, and his record, you know, is still the two records in, in his hundred and his two hundred record from London still stand as well, which is amazing. Yeah, he departs as record holder. You know, it's an interesting thing if if the competition maybe had been more ferocious for him early on. Who knows? He may it might have yeah. been the difference between making those split seconds and making the London Olympics, and what a moment that would have been. Like that's an ex- we we paid testament to his temperament to see off the Algerian opponent who was running faster than him throughout twenty twenty in some ways to have the discipline to train your backside off when you know you're probably going to win anyway i mean that's doubly yeah. impressive i mean I'd, I'd take a day off here and there clean i won't lie well <laughs> exactly but you wouldn't have the 21 medals hanging around you like that joe this is true. um and and by the way i just have a look if anybody gets a chance later on look at harry murphy from sports file photographer look at his lovely picture on twitter of him with medals all hanging off his arm it's an absolute classic it's a beautiful photo and um, really kind of captures the whole lot yeah you're absolutely right you know in some ways it was harder but he he has this competitive edge and that unbeaten thing is a huge thing for him and maintaining that unbeaten run for as long as it was that mm-hmm. was a massive thing for him so i think that probably motivated him when people were 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 so far away from him and then they started to you know catch him he was still trying to stay ahead. But um, I think, you know, uh, could he have gone to Paris? Yes, he could have gone to Paris, I think. And as I said, if he ran 10.59 last year, he could go to Paris. But I think as well, one of the factors is he has a seven-year-old and a four-year-old little girls. And, um, you know, it just means, as I said, it's it's more time consuming for him even every on a daily basis to go training you know it's more it's more difficult for him to do that kind of grind and um and and when he's away he was saying you know the kids really kind of miss him now so i think that is a factor probably but also one of the factors is him getting getting to work now for paralympics island because i think he feels that just from what he's learned at high performance level when he was out in Claremont training with that Lance Brahman group, which included Tyson Gay and people like that, and then came back to England and trained in England again with another group in um, in London um, and was working with you know Olympic medalists at that stage. I think that's he he felt then this is what high performance really is and this is what I can now pass on to the next generation. But I totally totally and utterly gifted and you know uh, you i don't see if we'll, i don't think we're ever going to see anybody winning winning like he won no 19 years unbeaten in anything is extraordinary uh, you mentioned you mentioned uh, hessian and Ulatunde ahead of him now as as fastest men so was there i'm trying to do the maths here was there a time where jason smith was ireland's fastest man I uh, yeah um no I think I think he I think Hessian ran it before him Did I, I okay. to be corrected on that yeah he won three Irish Irish hundred meter titles as well um but. I don't think he ever faced Hessian. Oh, he did. Maybe the 20, 2012 one was the one. Uh, he didn't face Hessian in, t- in a couple of those finals as well. But yeah, three-time national 100 meter champion as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah extraordinary career. Uh, Kleena, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. No Cheers. problem. Cheers. Kleena Foley with us, uh, paying tribute to Jason Smith, who's announced his retirement again, unbeaten in 18, 19 years of competition, six Paralympic gold medals, eight world championships, six European goals, and he retires still as the world record holder in the 100 and 200 metres. T13, he's announced his retirement this evening.